it wanted to it wanted to establish whether education emergency response plan has enabled provision of accessible and safe infrastructure for children with hearing and visual impairments. This is just one of the objectives that the study looked at. We actually benchmarked on the, obje on the five objectives of the education response plan for, for refugees and host communities. And this was one of them. The others were to determine how the ERP has supported teachers recruitment, training and professional development with competencies in sign language interpretation, braille literacy and mobility. The other was to establish whether ERP ensures provision of appropriate instructional materials for children with hearing and visual impairments. The other was to ascertain how EERP has developed capacity of relevant personnel to supervise, inspect, and guide teachers and educators working with these children of focus for our study, and also to determine how the EERP has enhanced community engagements to support the education of children with hearing and visual impairments. It was, a, it was really a big study. But for this presentation, I'm going to present on this specific objective of whether this ERP enabled provision of accessible and safe infrastructure for children with hearing and visual impairments. The methods that we used uh, included that the fact that, as I've already mentioned, our study site was Chaka 2 and Achivale refugee settlements in Chegegwa and in Sinjiro districts in Uganda. The study design was a cross-section analytic design with mixed methods approach. And the study population included refugee children with visual and hearing impairment aged eight to 17 years in and out of school. We're interested in this age group because uh, children in, in refugee settlements really study when they're a bit older compared to the other children not in refugee settlements. Our sample size selection and data collection methods included the fact that we worked with 48 child participants who were conveniently selected to share their stories and drawings. We worked with 18 parents who were selected randomly for semi-structured interviews. We worked with 16 key informants who were purposely selected and interviewed. We worked with 18 teachers who were selected randomly and they filled self-administered questionnaires. Our data analysis for quant qualitative data was thematic analysis. And we also analyzed our data, I mean, our quantitative data using stata analysis. Next. Uh, our results showed that <clears throat> in the school compound or from the school compound indicators that we used, we found that effort made by schools and partners to prevent and respond to hazards scored 79%. While effort to eliminate obstacles to ease movement and interaction for children with disabilities uh, scored 50%. The other indicators, the next slide. Grace, are you there? Hello, can you hear us? We can't hear you.
Emma, we don't have audio. Do you know what has happened? Uh, it seems our presenter was having challenges with her internet. She seems to have logged off and she has just rejoined. She's sorry. back. Um, right. that, I'm very, very sorry. My internet just uh, went off. Uh, I was still presenting on the other school compound indicators. And I was saying that for the small sand compounds, field potholes, sudden drops not being there, even surfaces being available, uh, that indicator scored only 43%. For stairs with hundreds to ease movement of these children with hearing and visual impairments, it's only scored 36%. For the brightly colored tape on door frames to actually uh, enable children with visual impairment to access where they are going, it scored only 29%. For the thick lines on edges of steps, only 21%. So all these indicators are below 50% and only two were above 50% um, average. Um, this was also indicated in the narrations of these children for the, uh, for the theme on specific needs of children with visual impairment and children with hearing impairment met by schools, treatment of learners at school, enjoyment of school environment. This is what the children told us. There was one specific girl with a visual impairment who said, they once knocked me down and I stepped on a stone and got injured. Well, she could not see. Then a boy with, with visual impairment also told us that there are some children who fight me because they are very sharp to my toes since I don't see well. Another one also told us that the problems I face is that when there is sunshine, I do not see well. And when there is wind, I do not see well also. Sometimes I move in wind and I step on colleagues and step on something and I... I, I I, I fell down. So those are some of the challenges that these children told us while they are, they are on the school compound and even when they are walking to school. Uh, inside classroom, inside the classroom, the indicators uh, showed us a number of things that we also should take note of. For example, seventy one percent was accrued to the sufficient lighting. They agreed that the sufficient lighting, although they, did go, they didn't go into details whether this lighting was really enough for even the children with visual impairments. Then um, sufficient space, 57%. We wanted to find out if the classrooms are even accessible for both these categories of children with hearing and visual impairment. It's quite 57 as well, 57% as well. We wanted to find out if the, the, the no noise, they were, these classrooms were not noisy. It scored 43%. We wanted to find out if there were notice boards, uh, particularly for these children with visual impairments and also the hearing impairments. What do they do for them? It scored only 36%. And for the reduced clutter in the classrooms, uh, removing benches on the way, removing uh, ob objects in the way, it scored only 14%. And for the brightly, uh, brightly colored classrooms, it scored 7%, meaning there's a problem because brightly colored, 7%, then sufficient lighting, 71%. Um, like you see in the next slide, for the specific needs of children with visual impairment and children with hearing impairments met by schools in specifically ability by the learner to express him or herself. In the picture there, you can see these children actually were able to express themselves. They told us their stories. They drew their stories on the charts because we wanted them to draw for us their home environment, the school environment, the home environment, the the the, the compound of the, of the schools and they were able, able to do that as you can see in the picture and also uh, inside that classroom we captured the teachers feeding in their questionnaires still that in the next term um, in, in that other picture you see that 
uh, the, the, the child was able to draw their classroom and then the, the compound ETC. Then um, in the next slide, we got some crucial information from a key informant on the existence of inclusive education setting. I doubt if the government has provided any specific requirements with construction, they, they try to guide and they'll make sure that all the facilities are accessible. But when we did the accessibility audit, we found out that even what they are talking of classes or facilities being accessible, they didn't understand what accessibility in itself means. By just me looking at a ramp, at the entrance of a class or office, they thought that is okay. There are standards, there are measurements which make a ramp, a real ramp, so they were not aware of these things. But at least they have that feeling that classrooms should be accessible. This shows that there was a problem they did not know. They know that a ramp is necessary, but didn't know even the measurements and standards to follow. So in the discussion and our implication indicates that while there is effort to enable provision of accessible and safe infrastructure for all learners, it mainly scored below average. And I think we saw it. It was only that the, the, the smoothed compounds and what that tried to, to actually all that scored below and only two indicators scored uh, above, above average, above 50%, which shows that really the school compounds are not convenient, they're not comfortable, they're not um, accessible for these children with hearing and visual impairments. Then the education emergency response plan did not, not clearly describe an ideal inclusive education context. Like we've seen with the, the, the quotation from the key informant, uh, infrastructure is not inclusive of the specific issues of children with visual and hearing impairment, not specific at all. Yes, we are talking of inclusive education, but not specific to the learners with, uh, with those vision and hearing impairments. Um, still, the discussion indicates that the ERP failed to facilitate provision of safe and accessible infrastructure for children with visual and hearing impairment. And so provision depends on the adequacy of funds. And much is really done for these children. When the funds are there, something is done. And lastly, it is even generic. Generic, like I've said, when you reach these schools, when you look at the environment, when you look at the compounds, it is generic in a sense that it, it everything done there, every, uh, every furniture and everything is generic. It is general for every child, but there's nothing tailored specific for these children to cater for their specific learning needs. And um, in conclusion, therefore, the education emergency response plan still remains a distant reality for children with hearing and visual impairments and barriers continue to impair the participation of these children with hearing and visual impairment in education, the infrastructure for specific learning needs for these children with hearing and visual impairments is still lacking. The EERP is, we found out that it is a long-term plan which was, which, which was not designed to address the emergency education issues. Emergency in terms of uh, having this constant influx, sometimes, they, 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 for example, we noted in our full report that in 2016, 2017, there was a big, big influx of refugees into these refugee settlements. Even when we're doing our research, we could see cars ferrying in uh, these settlements. refugees in this set of, we found out or we noticed in our research that it is a long-term plan, not really addressing emergency education issues for the refugees in these refugee settlements. 
uh, the key recommendations, government should review the Education Emergency Response Plan or the Education Response Plan for Refugees and Host Communities, um, should put more emphasis on resource mobilization and appropriate allocation of the same resources to make sure that every child is included in the education, um, in the education service. And refugee schools should be supported uh, to put up safe and accessible infrastructure for all learners. This is still government mandate to do that. This we discovered that we, 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 during our research, we discovered that uh, most of the schools in these refugee settings initially were actually um, were, were actually being run and being managed by private people by private organizations. But as we talk now, most of these refugee schools are being taken on by government. Majority of them uh, in, in both the camps that we did our research in are being um, made government schools. So government should support to put up safe and accessible infrastructure for all learners. And then the AERP should be more practical to address emergency education issues because that's constant influx requires that this ERP um, enables these children to also fit within the education system that is available. And they, they should tailor those specific issues to address the specific, I mean, the specific issues for the children with hearing and visual impairments. Acknowledgement goes to all participants from whom we got information, a lot of information. Actually, our report is very rich and has a lot of information. Acknowledgement goes to AfriChild and the funders, and acknowledgement goes to um, my employers in NTISD management, that is in Samizi Training Institute of Social Development, uh, where I work and my colleagues work, and those are the contact details. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, uh, Grace Lisa Nachimbuwe, uh, for this uh, very informative presentation. I'm sure you have generated uh, quite a number of questions in the audience. As I mentioned to you, I had uh, suggested that we wait until she completes the presentation and you had two options of coming up with questions. One, uh, you write them in the Q&A uh, folder. Uh, the other one, uh, if you want to orally present or make a submission, please uh, put up your hand and we shall select you to, to be able to make your submission. So in the Q&A, there is a one, one comment. Let me see. Uh, this comment is from Regers Twesige, and it says, kindly elaborate on how data was collected and documented uh, from children with hearing disability. Uh, so the, there's another one, the hand is up. Oh, the hand has gone down. The hand is up from Sarah Ayesiga. Let's hear Sarah Ayesiga's question, and then you will handle both of them. Go ahead, Sarah, please unmute and ask your question or make your submission. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Are you all getting me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. I mean, uh, I want to thank very much the, the, the presenter and all the team that actually everyone in the team that went out to get this information. It is very vital information. And the, actually, we as a ministry, uh, we have uh, actually been longing and we are still longing for some of these evidences to come up so that we can uh, address them. And I know I will be giving some other re reflections because Connie approached me and uh, told me to be part of this uh, webinar so that we can share, we can reflect on further. But my question now, is about uh, the numbers 
because uh, there are very many of those children who are out of school or children with disabilities generally are out of school for many reasons that I will even share later. But for this one, I wanted to know how many, did you try to get how many against how many who, 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 are, who are visible uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the communities? Did you manage to really get down to find out because the, the numbers uh, give us a clear picture on how many they are out there and therefore we can plan for them accordingly. For now, that is my question, but I think I will come later to reflect on other issues, especially uh, general things about the education of our children with disabilities and especially in the refugee settlements. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Sarah. Uh, uh, Lisa, Grace Lisa, can you please go ahead and respond to both the question from Rogers, which was in the chat, and the comment and question from Sarah? Unmute. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Great questions and observations from these children with hearing aid. Our colleague, what is, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. You had disappeared, but we can hear you now. Okay. So I'm, I'm saying that we indeed collected data from these children, those with hearing impairment and those with visual impairment. Of course, when we talk about these, some people imagine children are totally blind or totally with, with a range of these children. We worked with a range of these children and not all of them were totally deaf or totally blind. Some of them could see a little, could hear a little, but those with hearing impairments, we, we made them draw. They, we had draw, we, they made their drawings. They drew the school environment, the classroom environment. They drew the, their homes. They were able to draw once we explained to them uh, through uh, the sign language, which one of us was, was well conversant with. One of our of the researchers, Mr. Chaz, was well conversant with it. But some of them could hear a little. You could talk to them and they would be able to understand what you're saying. We actually got like one who was totally deaf and one who was totally blind, and we still worked with them. Then that for the visually impaired children, we made them tell their stories because for them now they could not draw. They, we sat with them, uh, they talked to us still about what their environment is about, what their sound, the, the home environment, whom they stay with, who helps them here and there. They were able to tell us that and were able to document that. We have the, we still even have the drawings, we still have their uh, narratives or narrations. So that's how we collected data from these children. And then for them, for, for children out of school, as I, when I, began my presentation of Ministry of Education and Sports with their work of 2018, where they showed that there were um, about 685,000 refugee children aged 3 to 17 years. And 61% uh, of these children were out of school. So the percentage is 61% of children out of school of these refugee children. It's a big, big percentage really. And indeed, as we moved in this refugee settlement, quite many in the schools, but again, and we, we actually inter interacted with them in the communities as well, because we're in, in the schools, but also the out of school and we went to their community and found them there 
some others had not even joined so this pretend them to join school but they are there in the communities and then also uh the, the like we showed the statistics only 39 percent in school with 47 percent only uh females so i think that tries to answer the question and okay. from fr from our research of course also explain that further in the report all right Thank so you. thank you very much, uh, Ms. Nachimbugwe. Uh, we have two questions or comments in the chat, in the Q&A chat. The first one is, I would like to know why the study focused on only visual and hearing impairment and ignored the other disabilities. And the second one is, we also work with research assistants. This is the, one of the the members of the study team, the research team, uh, Ms. Bernadette Nagai. We also worked with research assistants who are already working with these children to help in translation, uh, both children and adults. So can you answer the first question? We need to move ahead. So if you can make the answer short so that we move on. Oh, okay. May I go ahead? Please go ahead. Yes. Yes, thank you very much for, for the question. Why visual impairment? Why hearing impairment? You know, impairment is big. It is, I mean, disability is a big, big concept with so many uh, impairments in it. So for us, our interest was visual impairment and hearing impairment because in our prior, prior assessments and also the literature, it showed that many of these children were there. So we, were, it, we wanted to, understand how they are, they are included in the education system since they, they seem to be many in these refugee settlements. So our interest was also in the numbers and also the, the, the category that we limited, we could not do everything. To, the study would be so, so ambiguous and somehow would lose focus. And like we all know, every research should be focused. Every research should be focused such that we, 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 we bring out the core uh, information that we want to give to the listeners and to the people to read our reports. Then for the second comment, it was from our mentor, Madame Bernadette Sibete, who was saying, who was really confirming with what I earlier said, that we worked also with research assistants who are, uh, who knew the, the languages of these children and could also help to talk with them and also help to, to, to collect data easily from them. Because having a hearing impairment does not mean you don't talk or you, don't, uh, you cannot communicate, you can communicate. And also having a visual impairment doesn't mean you cannot uh, express yourself. Like I said, they were able to do so and were able to get information from all the means that we had designed. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Ms. Grace Lisa Nakimbugwe, uh, for that presentation and also for responding to those questions and comments in a way that we were all able to understand and appreciate the work that you did better. Uh, next, we are going to move into the next session, and I would like to introduce Ms. Connie Alezuyo. Uh, she's going to give us her reflections from the perspective of the Ministry of Education and Sports, uh, where she works. And as you heard in the introduction, she's an expert uh, in that uh, ministry. Connie, over to you, please. Um, thank you, Professor, and uh, good, af good afternoon, colleagues. I will take this opportunity to introduce my colleague, Madam Sarah Ayesiga. I did invite her to this meeting because I was thinking that um, I should not even have been the right person to be able to effectively, you know, review and uh, just try and discuss this panel because I felt I would be very, very subjective probably. But uh, I, nevertheless, I said no, I think I'll take it up. So I would like to invite her just for two minutes, Madam Sarah, just for two minutes kindly give some brief reflections on this and want to thank Madame Grace and her team very much for this study and for the findings and for the recommendations. Now over to Madame Sarah, Commissioner, Assistant Commissioner Sarah Ayesiga, please. We have a short time, we have about 10 minutes. So I'll give okay. some two and a half minutes to Madame Sarah 
then I hope I can wrap up. I, I can also have some discussion and share some information and also give some direction for you know, research issues that still need co related to children with uh, disabilities, especially hearing and uh, visual impairments. Thank you, and over to you, Madam Grace. I mean, Madam Sarah, sorry. Thank you very much, Connie, and especially when for you really took an initiative to invite me for this webinar. It is very, very critical and crucial for us as a ministry, especially the Department of Special Needs and Inclusive Education. We are really very, very, very appreciative. Members, uh, the issues of children with disabilities not accessing education is very critical and it is worse when it comes to uh, children with the, who are in refugee settlements. Uh, first of all, there is a, a challenge of capacity uh, for the teacher capacity. Many of those, those teachers are not trained. Some, many of them do not have the pedagogy. Many of them lack the skills of her, uh, managing these children. And therefore, uh, accessing education is really very, very, very uh, critical and uh, something that we need to talk about and to really carry forward when we talk, we are talking about emergencies of these children in education. It's very important. Uh, language, uh, language is key. Actually, I am, uh, I am very uh, happy, I would say I'm happy, but at the same time surprised to know that the researchers managed to go in these researchments and managed to, to get information from these children because we understand very many of them, especially the, 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 the deaf, some of them we have interacted with them. Sometimes communication is very difficult. We want to thank you very much for the initiative actually to get them papers and pen to write and you were able actually even to interpret what they were answering. Because the sign language is not yet there and the trainings are not yet, have not yet been taken place. We are only starting to ensure that we train these students on how to communicate with the others. We want to thank you very much. The issues of, of children uh, with disabilities, actually, I myself, I have, I'm trying to to do some, some study on how, how has the AEP, because uh, we have our partners who are implementing accelerated education, and it is for out of school and over age for grade. So I am trying to really, I have also designed something that, that I wanted to carry out to study. How has this, this AE responded to the, to the, to the, to the out of school, the, the, those many children who are out of school and majority of them are children with disabilities. If we could, some of you, I'm going to reach you out to you and we see how, because they are the ones who are worstly and very much affected by not accessing education. Here we are having alternatives to education because of these children who have been out and we are finding that when you look for, you search for them in the different AE uh, arrangements, they are not there. They were saying, what do we do? The other one, the formal, they are not there. When we bring an alternative, still they are there, they are missing in this alternative. How do we improve, actually I'm looking, how do we improve the, the alternatives that have been brought on board, especially the AE, to bring them on board? So to see Thank to you, Madam Sarah. Mm. Madam Sarah, I'm afraid yes, I must continue. interrupt you and allow you to yeah. put a poll, but I promise that mm. we shall share your contact and uh, allow the discussions to be able to conclude so that for now, we can just focus on the results that we are shared and the implications yeah. for, you know, for, for, but thank you very, very much for those very, and for the passionate case that you have made. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, very quickly, I think, and also you have helped me to summarize the key points, so I won't go into that summary, but I thought that mm -hmm. it was very important for me to just make a clarification on the response plan, because what uh, Ministry of Education and Sports both launched, launched and implemented is called the Education Response Plan for refugees and host communities, because government of Uganda recognizes that there is no school that is only for refugees. Even when it's within the settlements where the refugees are living, it is always in the vicinity of host communities. So because of that, government in its wisdom set up a response plan for refugees and host communities. And it is true, sometimes you find many times, actually, the populations of refugees might be three to one, three being refugee 
populations and one being the host communities, but still that's a very significant population. And we always make sure to talk about, um, we talk about both, uh, both the ref refugees and the host communities. Then the second one is also still to inform the, the, the audience that we do have a follow up, a second response plan to the first one, which was three and a half years. So as of last year, there is a second response plan and it would be interesting for you also to be look at what the numbers look like four years down the road from the implementation. But Madame Brace did bring up very, very salient issues because I remember when she talked about what is, what is the atmosphere like for ch a child without, uh, who can't see or who may not be able to hear and they're in a school setting and they have all this compound with many people. And for me, what was very, very significant was about the access to information, which is on notice board, also about the clutter, how the classes are arranged. And we know that sometimes even classes are very, very crowded and the children have to probably, I, I know that the teachers then focus where they can be able to place the learners so they have ease of access. And then the other issue also relates to the, the color and the, the handrails as well. So I think we can just imagine the kind of situation a learner goes through. And related to that, I also know that when we did an assessment, uh, we did an independent evaluation of uh, the ERP. And when we did that, I remember one of the key things was um, the learning outcomes. Are the children learning at using early grade reading and early mathematics reading? And for language, it was a big problem. And it just concurs with the finding when we're talking about the children coming from different places and sometimes being able to express themselves is not very easy. And then the other issue that I think I wanted to also talk about relates to the finding, the findings related to the, actually, uh, Madame Grace talked about the, the accessibility audit and looking at specifications for construction, whether they are, you know, they make life easy for the learner. If they're walking on a veranda, they can be able to tell they're getting to the end of that veranda properly. And I, I just want to mention that indeed, when you see the challenges that a learner goes a learner with disabilities goes through to be able to just get into class, it's already almost 50% of the, of the, of the inequity that they face. So I think that calls for you know, support in that as well. I, I do know we appreciate the partnerships and in terms of trying to make uh, the partners organizations in trying to ease this. In Bujubuli, that's in Chaka too, there's been this uh, special needs school, it's an inclusive school, but there is a section that is um, for children with um, special needs, because recognizing the distances and all these barriers to be try to try and bring them closer, so that they either limit the dropout or they're able to, you know, have an easier time. That is one thing that I also just wanted to inform as well that the situation is bad, but there is some steps to be able to make this. And then in terms of research and research uh, opportunities for research. I'd, I'd like us to reflect, when we reflect in our vernaculars or in our indigenous languages, the names that we usually give to somebody with disability, or I mean, especially with somebody who can't speak. And if we think of a blind person, many times the names that we give are very derogatory. And so when we look at access for children with, with hearing and uh, visual impairments to school, I think the other issue that we need to think about also is the kind of language that becomes accepted within the communities because children come from communities and they go back to communities. So I'd like to contend that I think it's very important for us to unpack that. What kind of language in the mother tongues do we use? And what is the implication of this that affects the attitudes? In some of the blurbs about the children's experiences, one of the children was saying that I get pushed down. People make fun of me and they are being stubborn, but they are making fun of me. And yet this is already somebody who naturally should be getting inspiring sympathy from children. But then when you find children look at this as, you know, they don't even try and empathize, I think it really speaks very, very strongly into the kind of, uh, you know, homes and uh, households and the uh, community as well in terms of the in terms of the emphasis that needs to be shared. About, I mean, advocacy, sorry, not emphasis on how we can be able to ensure that when they come into school, that's already one huge barrier overcome, but they're able to stay and their colleagues are able to help them to be, to, they're able to help them as well. So I think uh, then the last thing, just in terms of conclusion, and uh, just in terms of conclusion, 
I think the other observation I'd also like to make is um, related to um, key informants and key people who are able to speak into this research just in terms of now improving it, because I know it is very, very good, but just to be able to synthesize some of that, I think it would be useful to be able to also refer to some of the more recent documentation so that one can be able to triangulate that and then we can have a document. And I don't know whether it's within average child's or what, um, scope to be able to also come up with some kind of a technical brief because many times research papers are very long and busy executives may not be able to look at them. So it would be useful if we just had like a brief, a technical brief also to be able to highlight some of the findings. I'm sure it would not just influence impl impl uh, impl implementation, but it will also be able to provide evidence that is easily available. And once again, thank you very much for the opportunity just to share a few of the insights that we have. And thank you for the contribution that you make to the research. Over to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Constance and Madam Sarah, for your reflections from the perspective uh, of the policy level in government. Uh, you are both from the Ministry of Education and Sports, and you have experience in this field, education uh, with the uh, refugee populations in addition to the host populations. We are going to take a few minutes and thank you for keeping time, by the way, you, you have done a great job. You have given us enough time for questions and submissions and comments. And so we are going to open it up. Uh, I'll first look in the chat room while I wait for the hands to come up. And uh, there is nothing in the chat related to the reflections. So we are going to go to the attendees to see if there are any hands up. Um, can we have hands up, please? Are there any hands, any questions you want to ask? Or comments? Well, you asked um, whether Afri Child has the mandate to uh, churn out technical briefs. I'm not a part of AfriChild, but I can say that as part of the training, uh, the inter-university child-focused research training, the participants who are taught how to write proposals, how to apply for money, and how to go and, and conduct the research, but also in terms of dissemination, they were taught how to write publishable papers, but also summary forms of dissemination. For example, policy briefs, technical briefs, uh, those were also covered. So they should be able to do that. And I think if you go on the website, uh, you should be able to get some more briefs, not specifically of this research which is being presented or disseminated now, but of research which has been conducted uh, under the guidance of Africa previously. I don't know whether there is anybody from Africa child who would like to add to that, but while we are waiting, Sarah has a comment to make. Uh, please go ahead and make your submission. Thank you very much, moderator. And once again, please thank you and the uh, Benedict and the rest, and then Connie. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, the, 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 the further use of uh, these findings. Uh, maybe uh, do we do we have a plan of uh, uh, furthering this research and especially of uh, finding out what about other because even in the in, in the in the question there there was what about other why only PI and HI uh, so uh, and it was well answered because it is a huge you can't just get everything uh, at a go but do we have uh, do we have a plan of really going further to look at other disabilities. Thank you. Okay, so um, what Africa does, and the, this is in relation to the inter-university training that I mentioned, is to provide the training skills uh, to the participants and they select which research area that is related to child-focused research they are interested in pursuing. And the, so the opportunities are there to pursue this further and look at other disabilities. But also the other 
arm, which is also another collateral training that is done hand in hand with the research training, is the training of policymakers and research users. Uh, that one is very important because we bring the policymakers from ministries. I think we have had people from, from Ministry of Education, Ministry of Gender, Health, and other um, NGOs, uh, national level NGOs, to come and listen to the presentations and the disseminations of the research. And then they discuss how these research findings can be taken up uh, and, the, and used for policy formulation. So there is a link. There are a number of interrelated activities which go on at AfriChild that really, I think, should contribute to the improvement of child well-being and health in Africa. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so now if we go back to the program, uh, we have done the question and answer, but uh, I just need to, to do a bit of wrap up. Uh, and the, by saying that we have been very, very fortunate to have this presentation here today. And I would like you to join me in uploading are the presenters, that is the team of researchers from Samizi Training Institute, and also the team of discussants from the Ministry of Education and Sports. Thank you very much, uh, both teams, uh, for making this, this uh, uh, webinar uh, very exciting and very interactive, and we hope that you'll be able to come again and present when we next invite you. Uh, we want to also mention that uh, this was the sixth webinar uh, in the, the, the research that has been conducted from the seven institutions. I believe we have one more webinar and hopefully when we invite you, you will come for that also. And then after that, uh, we would have completed uh, webinars from the second cohort of the trainees uh, who participated in the inter-university uh, research training program. AfriChild also has other webinars of research that they conduct, and those are usually advertised, and you are also invited to, to come and attend those as well as to visit AfriChild and see how you can work together uh, in, in supporting your research, but also in making sure that you contribute to the AfriChild mandate. Uh, right now, as you can see, uh, you are getting, you have been given uh, the information in, in case you want to follow closely what is being done at AfriChild. The website is there, www.africhild.or.ug. And then the others are there, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, X, and not, not Twitter, X, and so on and so forth. So um, with that, I want to say that uh, we thank you very much uh, for all the contribution that you have made. We want to thank AfriChild for creating this forum and this environment for discussion of the key important, key um, aspect of children. And we hope that we shall continue to get such webinars in future. So thank you very much, uh, all of you for having uh, attended uh, this webinar. I will pause here and see if there is any comment from AfriChild uh, before we close the webinar. Yes, Professor, thank you very much for uh, gently moderating our session. My name is Clinton and I work as a communications officer at the AfriChild Center. 
I would like to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of our participants that spared off time this afternoon to join us from everywhere, every corner of the world, whether it's morning, evening or afternoon. Thank you very much for sparing time to join us for this webinar episode. We hope that uh, you can join us for our upcoming webinars. And please feel free to engage with our material. Check out our website for more of, our, of the details and all our communications. And by the fact that you've received this webinar invitation, that means that you are part of our email, uh, email chain. So we hope that uh, you be a part of all our online and offline events. We thank you and uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you, Prof, and thank you, everyone. Thank you and bye-bye. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Thank you and bye-bye.